So we begin at the beginning, uh, really the beginning, because interestingly, you were born in Budapest, Hungary, although I don't think you're Hungarian. Well, or are you? Well, my, my, I was born there, but I grew up in England. I was brought up in England. I went to school in, in England. So that was early childhood in Hungary. So your childhood was in England? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, let's look at you as an eight year old. Uh, where are you living? Who are your parents? What is this? the culture of your childhood. Yes, so I, I was uh, living in London. Um, so my father was a, a chemical engineer. Um, so my mother was interested in languages, was good at languages, she did translations. She had a teaching, oh. qu teaching qualification which she didn't use very much. I had an older sister. Um, I think I was a pretty ordinary child, but uh, I had a fairly early interest in science. So maybe by the time I was nine or ten, I think I had a strong interest in science. Are you noticing particular influences from your parents in terms of what they're thinking about you, hoping for you, or are you on your own intellectually, so to speak? Well, they were, were very uh, kind of hands-off, so I don't remember. I, I think my father was very happy that I liked science and I was good at it. He had uh, enormous respect for science, and I'm sure he... He probably wished that I had a career in science at that point, but I, he didn't, never told me, I don't think. Right. He didn't uh, insist. No, no, not at all. So I was very much uh, left to my own, own devices. Um, and I think I was kind of more of a, like a hobbyist. I did lots of things by myself to do with science. And he made it possible. So I remember going to a store once to get uh, electronic components, transistors, and I was interested in electronics and made transistor radios. That was How cool. things work. Yeah, Something yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. so, so. yes. So, um, what kind of schooling did they have in mind for you? Um, I don't know what they ha had in mind, but I, I had fairly ordinary schooling. So I had, uh, um, I went to the local school. Um, so we moved to the north of England when I was eleven. Okay. And then um, I went to a different school. So then this was the eleven plus system in England where. You take a test and then 20% right. 20, 20 of people go one way and uh, the rest the other way. So I went uh, one way. Um, there also existed much more selective schools, but they were far away. And, uh, so you no went to, it. we would call it a public school, but really a state school? A state school, yes. State, state school, yes, yes, yes. And was there an emphasis in the direction of, did the test you took at 11 determine a scientific career for you? Oh, not at all, no. This is just generic tests, I think, in English and arithmetic, I think. Ah. It's a general, I think, IQ kind of test. Um, so the whole population went through this test. And the society is determining who should get further education uh, exactly, at that point. Exactly, exactly, yes, yes, yes. So, okay. So that system changed a decade or two later. But, right. Uh, but it's the system that shaped you. So yeah, somebody determined, the, the test determined you were fit for academic studies. Right. Uh, you went to a state school in it. Um, is there at some point in your pre-university education um, a moment, a mentor, uh, a turning point? In uh, um, so, um, so again, the, uh, I was interested in, in science, but I, th I think I did everything by myself. I did talk. There were some other kids in, in school who, who one could interest, but my interests were rather more theoretical. So I think I'm interested in rockets, and I tried to calculate whether I could make a rocket which would, I could launch and would go around the world and land back in our garden. Uh, uh, that didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't work out, that one. <laughs> um, um, so I did, uh, it was fairly slow going, but when I was 17, we moved house again to London. And uh, at that point, I kind of uh, st uh, looked around, and at that point, I did go to one of these more uh, selective schools, which uh, um, had, had uh, students from a large part of London, and you know, getting into Oxford and Cambridge was, a, was, a, was the big purpose of those schools. Right. Um, so in that school, I was only there for, for a short time. Um, so there, I think uh, it, it was much more competitive than I'd seen. And also I had, a, I think I suppose the most influential teacher was a physics teacher and his main, uh, what he did, did for me was that um, I, I, I took a kind of a gap 
uh, two semesters. I somehow did things in a different order. So I got into Cambridge and I had two semesters and he got me a very nice science job in a medical physics laboratory in one of the medical schools in London. Oh. Just before university. Um, and uh, so that was uh, uh, very good for me. I, I, you know, the jobs were very hard to get those jobs. I'm yes, yes, yes. He, 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 he's he's certainly good for the money, but intellectually, was, what was the influence of doing this? Yeah, so, so, so the influence was that in high school I was very much interested in, in physics. And uh, I thought I'd want to become a physicist, maybe a theoretical physicist, um, or maybe an experimental physicist, I didn't know. Um, there's always a question, I was interested in mathematics, but I wanted to use it in some context. So physics was the, um, what I was thinking of. Um, so in some sense this job was, was good because it exposed me to experimental physics. And it told me that it's not what I wanted to do. So it, ah. it ruled something out for me yeah, at the important. early stage, which was very important, I think. Um, so then I turned slightly back more towards more theoretical things. I, I think it's a generalization that may not be true, but broadly in the Oxbridge context, when thinks of Cambridge as more science yes, yes, oriented, yes, were yes. you aware of that and thinking Cambridge rather than Oxford for that reason? Yeah, so ob obviously, yes. So people uh, like the school I went to at the end, everyone. So I applied to do math mathematics with physics. So everyone from that school is applying to Cambridge, not Oxford. That was kind of <laughs> right. In, in so, mathematics. You got in, we know, yes, yes. Um, and again, for an American audience, uh, we might not quite generally understand how much of a graduate kind of education one would get at Cambridge at that earlier point. I, I simply mean you could specialize very early. Yes, it was, uh, so even in high school, the last two years were somewhat maybe even over-specialized. Ah. That um, so certainly if you did mathematics and physics, then my perception was that the amount of material you were taught in the last two years of high school was rather small. You had to learn to manipulate it well, ah. but it wasn't a large amount of matter. Whereas once you got to university, then they did throw a lot of material to, uh, at you. Yes, yeah, so it was compared to American liberal arts education, it was totally specialized. Very um, specialized. So so. Uh, so each year you, you could change what you did. So I happened to do mathematics throughout. Um, of course, there there you are. Decided a tutor of some significance in your development uh, uh, in that precious tutorial system. Well, I, well, how, how it works out is that um, in mathematics we had uh, two tutors at any time: one applied math, one one pure math. Ah. And but many of these, some were faculty who. Occasionally they were well-known faculty, often they were graduate students or, or postdocs. Um, so one good thing was that you were exposed to uh, quite a few different people, so different, they, they, they could also change from different terms. So you know, if you wanted to find out you know, what people were doing in research, wanted to find out what was ahead, right. you, you met some people. So that was, uh, uh, that was good. You, you what are the years at this point that you're at Cambridge? What the, uh, the dates? You yeah. Mean, it was 67 to 70. Okay, um, in, in terms of your future interest and in work, um, where is the world of mathematics applied or otherwise at this point? What are people thinking about? What are you learning at this point? Um, well, uh, so what, um, uh, so, so, so in Cambridge, uh, mathematics is, uh, or was and I think still is, is a very kind of a high prestige things to study which means that effectively that many more people study it than those who just want to be specialist mathematicians. Ah. So to compare it to, say, uh, Harvard here, where the pure math undergraduates are a very small group, there, there were lots of people doing mathematics. Lots of people in mathematics. Uh, the, the idea being that they'd go on to do something else at some point. Yes, but yes. mathematics is a, good, is a good preparation. So, um, the, um, so you did fairly basic stuff, but I think it was quite a uh, large amount of it. Um, um, so, for example, it, it, I find it, find it less satisfying, you know, compared to being a this teenager hobbyist doing what I'm interested in. Here you were given a lot of material. So I remember one interaction with a, with a professor, I think this was fluid mechanics, where I, I didn't have that much interaction with, with uh, faculty that were kind of rather at a distance, but I was kind of complaining a bit that, you know, this course was made different bits and pieces and how did it all fit together. He said, oh yes, yes, uh, we do seven techniques in the course, 
But if you do this, know these seven techniques, then you can go almost anywhere afterwards. Okay, so, so the purpose of the course wasn't explained to you then, but it was good for you to have done it. Ah. <laughs> so that was the philosophy. So it wasn't that satisfying right. because you, you didn't quite understand why you were um, uh, why you were doing it. But as far as the general, so I was thinking of doing, still doing kind of some sort of applied mathematics, theoretical physics. Um, so if you want an, uh, just a, a picture, so if you've seen the uh, film, um, uh, The Theory of Everything about Hawking. Yes. So there, there's some scenes of mid 60s Cambridge. Yeah. So kind of, you know, that, that was me. The atmosphere. So his advisor, uh, Dennis Schaum, is someone who I took a course from. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how are you uh, determining next steps? How, how are you determining your competence? Uh, in mathematics, um, people begin to sort themselves out in terms of ability and future. What are you thinking about yourself as a potential mathematician? Um, I, I don't know. The, the, um, um, I was looking forward to, to working on, on problems by myself, on things I could concentrate on. Um, so there were people better than me at, at this kind of undergraduate uh, math where you had to learn a large amount and, uh, and, and perform well without understanding it that deeply. So, um, but that didn't kind of worry me. I, I mean, what, what worried me is what to do next. So I think, yes. I think uh, what uh, worried me is whether I wanted to carry on with this idea I had fr from, from my teens that I wanted to do physics, uh, some sort of mathematical physics. Um, um, so that's what concerned me. So certainly when I went to Cambridge, uh, I thought I'd do mathematics for two years and then change to physics. Uh, that was a possibility, but then I just did mathematics throughout. Um, and then, uh, so somehow I, 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 I looked very hard, but I couldn't find anything I really uh, was passionate about. Um, so um, as maybe as a way of taking a break, so I decided to go for one year to Imperial College London afterwards. And this was a kind of computer Just science. Just a break from a, a trajectory you were on. Yes, well, I think I understood that uh, computer science was something new, which mm -hmm. offered pot you know, potential, but it wasn't clear what it was. It was, it was re really very new. Um, and you were not being patronizing uh, in your thinking about it uh, as, a, as a break? No, I, I, I yeah. really mean because the, in the early stages of computer science, it takes a kind of either boldness or a, a sense that yes, there is something there. It's not a lesser form. Are you thinking any of that at this point? Well, um, I think uh, what I felt is that it's unknown. Uh, okay. So I think, uh, um, you know, as I've described it, that even when I became a computer scientist in the 70s, the whole field was flourishing, but it was almost like climbing a wall of fear. And, and the fear was that there wasn't very much there to discover. So maybe you did something, and then maybe after five years it's exhausted and there's nothing else to find. Wow. Okay, so, um, so the um, idea that it's quite as rich as it's turned out to be, um, I don't know how many people... Uh, would, that would have been a big leap of faith to assume yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think most people in computer science took that leap somehow, and uh, for various reasons. But I think I was very aware that um, it, it was... Uh, there was a risk there because I, because many of the things you um, you know you read about the current computer science and much of it was pretty simple you know you could yes. easily, easily understand it and it was in uh, the mathematics you'd been taught was you know, highly compressed stuff done over hundreds of years compressed to be almost incomprehensible here it was everything was understandable clear right. and you know anyone could do it that, so that was the um, thing. So, um, so then I spent this year at Imperial College and then, and then I really had to decide what to do next. <laughs> okay, so I was going to apply to do a PhD somewhere in something. And uh, so then I did my homework, I went to libraries. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so the number of, uh, of, okay, I also decided I wanted to do something back more mathematical. So that was a decision. Um, I wasn't so interested in the practical aspects of computing. Um, and then there were a limited number of places in England where you could do this, where you could do a PhD in mathematical aspects of computer science. Very few. Um, but I read the, um, uh, read the research of, of these few centers. Yes, of course. Um, and then I did have a kind of eye-opening experience, so then I discovered my future place, Warwick. So I read uh, actually one paper written by um, 
Mike Patterson, and who became my advisor, and his advisor, David Park. And so in some sense, this paper was about computability um, in, the, in the tradition of Turing. And by reading that paper, I first understood uh, computability in the sense of Turing, and just the, um, as, a, as, a, you know, as a incredible development, which I wasn't aware happened, uh, uh, as far as a kind of mathematical theory of, of intellectual life, that you know, yes. computability theory explains how you know, certain mathematical pro mathematics problems you have to, you know, each problem you have to work away at, there's no universal way of, of solving it, um, which explains you know, thousands of years of mathematical development. Yes. And so uh, this paper I was reading was, again, a very concrete, uh, natural problem, which was, was not computable. Um, so, so I think there I saw that both this whole topic of computability had this great mystery, you know, there's yes. in, infinite depth, but also it was totally different from anything I'd, I'd seen before. So, so you're really touching the beginning of your, your life at this point, I mean, as a, as a, a productive scholar. This, you, you, you're sensing now where you want to go. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and, it was, and you were... In fact, at Warwick, is that where you? No, no. The, well, the, uh, no. I I did this in London. Did uh, I was in this one-year uh, graduate program, and trying to research where to apply to, where to, go. Where to apply. Um, and then I, I did apply to Warwick, and uh, I got in. Um, and was I, I, I want to ask uh, maybe not a profound question, but this is the point where the, these are called the red brick universities. Uh, uh, red. Okay. Well, uh, actually, okay. So the the um, the red brick universities were universities which which were established in the nineteenth and early twentieth century. So these were called plate glass universities. Yes. Okay. This was a you know, so this is a, another round of universities founded after the Second World War. Yes. So Warwick, I think, the first group of students came through nineteen sixty four. Yes. So um, in a way, that's yeah. whatever the the context of the hierarchy. It's where they're trying new things. Um, yes, I mean, um, as, as, as intellectual emphases and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think Warwick um, was special because it had a very strong mathematics program and still has. Somehow, it by the force of personality of one person, it recruited a lot of people from, from uh, especially Cambridge, and uh, it obviously had good management. They, I think, they decided to concentrate on a, a few subjects and doing it seriously rather than um, so they. Uh, one of the very successful new universities. So it was a very strong uh, mathematics department by then, and there was a new computer science department. It was kind of a, when I got there, it was a, almost an empty building. As a graduate student, I got a nice office because there was yes. no one else to <laughs> take the offices. Um, there were very few graduate students. Um, so my PhD advisor, Mike Patterson, so he, he'd He'd done a PhD in Cambridge earlier, mm. and he spent three years at MIT, and had just come back the same time as, as uh, I arrived. Um, so that, that was a uh, very good experience at, at Warwick. So uh, Mike was a very kind of uh, generous uh, yeah. advisor. We spent a lot of, uh, of time together, um, and also quite interesting that he kind of his worldview was kind of. A bit different from mine, so it was a case of me learning something from someone who's a bit different. Yes, so, yes. so he had a. How are, how are you deciding on the direction of your dissertation? Um, well, he. Um, uh, I mean, he he, had, he suggested some problems, and that's what I. Uh, I worked on problems. And what were those problems? Uh, well, these were. Um, so at that point. Um, so these were decidability problems related to, to his thesis. So general questions whether a certain question has a has an algorithm for for getting a solution or whether it has, had no algorithm right. um, so by that time um, uh, certainly in North America the emphasis had shifted not just to saying whether something is computable but how efficiently it was computable so it is algorithms and, and complexity which becomes very key to some of your insights yeah so that, yeah way. so so what I was doing in some sense was a bit uh, old-fashioned um, on the other hand, it was uh, kind of a very, very simple, mathematically simple and difficult problem, which, which I, I couldn't solve, and I solved special cases. Um, so uh, something else one can uh, uh, think about. So some people are very lucky with their PhD theses, that it's fashionable and never wanted. So in my case, I got something which was very difficult, so I 
So maybe uh, that's got some advantages too. You understand the, your limits. Um, right. So that, that, that's what I found out from my, my PhD experience. So the the, P, the the nature of your research yeah, yeah. for your PhD did not shape the direction that your future work would go. I mean, no, no, no. But in that period, I did have uh, so my advisor did have other interests too, and we had lots of conversations. So I think I was quite. Uh, and up to date with where the field was going. Just the problem I was trying to solve was something left over from some earlier years. And well, you've had, in the end, and we yeah. won't go there yet, yes, but yes. broadly you've had a transatlantic career. Right. But uh, what are the temptations at this point, particularly as you're about to get your degree, to go to what may have seemed a wider universe of computer interest yes, in, yes. in the United States? Yes, so in fact, what, what my interest became was uh, practice mostly in North America and much less in Europe. Ah. Um, so, uh, so my subsequent career, so I spent one year, I finished my PhD in a fairly short time and I spent one year at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Ah, directly? Uh, yeah, after my PhD somehow ah. I finished earlier than expected, somehow a short term job turned up so I, I did that for a year. Um, then I had to think harder, then I went back to Britain for about eight years to Leeds and Edinburgh. Um, so then, then, yes, I was uh, in, um, I wasn't where the crowd was in this field, um, but I didn't, um, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I obviously chose, I, cho I chose it, I don't think I, I suffered. Um, so um, I tended to make up my own problems, um, but maybe just to give a one characterization. So during that eight-year period, uh, so every year I came to the U.S. Uh, for one of the major conferences. Right, of course. And uh, I was always conscious of this question that I want to see what's going on, to catch up, and maybe I'll change the course and do something which someone else was thinking was good. And I think what I found, in fact, each time I found out lots of interesting things which influenced me. But then when I went back, I was carried on doing what what, what, right. what I was going to do. So. It seems that uh, I was fairly strongly motivated uh, internally in what I thought were good, were good questions. It's odd to put it this way, but as you're launched in your career, um, what is your first major problem and insight? I mean, uh, it's silly to put it that way because it's a process, but essentially the next stage of, of uh, Inquiry and revelation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean, right? Uh, what, what your uh, um, threshold is for these things. But I suppose the first result, which, um, you know, if you measure it from outside uh, right. interpretation. Yeah, okay. So, so when I was in Pittsburgh, I got one result which attracted attention. So it's the kind of result which. You know, if you mention it, people say, "Oh, yeah, uh, people interested here." Uh -huh. okay. It's not something. Not something you have to kind of persuade them of is interesting. Right. You don't have to. It's um, a good definition. <laughs> yeah, something which kind of sells itself. Uh, yes. Um, so this was uh, on. Uh, this, so this is on, on context free recognition. So, so languages, natural languages, and formal languages, and computer languages. People try to characterize what forms a grammar and context-free yes. language. Uh, I think it's, uh, the Sanskrits knew about it, but it's, 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 a, it's the most natural way of describing a, a formal grammar of how a right. sentence is subject, object, etc. Uh, but the question is, okay, but, a, um, a, but a sentence can have, uh, you can have a grammar where the same sentence has many interpretations, so it's ambiguous. And this yes. is one reason why, so given a formal gra grammar, a given a kind of sentence, the question is, is this sentence legal in the grammar? Yes. Um, and the question is, how efficiently can this be determined? Um, so this is all, all within the very specific uh, uh, notion of context-free languages, which was defined by Chomsky as a precise thing. Um, and so I got a more efficient uh, algorithm for this, um, using, um, using kind of algebraic techniques which uh, and they're using results which are fairly recent then. Um, um, so there's there's some recognition of this. I, th I, I think uh, if I'm right, because I, I've mm -hmm. done a little bit of research in your background, is this in the late 70s that this... Yeah, this was in the mid-70s, so it was published in 75. 
In 75. Yeah. Um, a next, I think, landmark moment for you, but you can tell me when you're uh, credited with a new class of complexity is in the late 70s. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. So this is uh, about um, uh, saying a computational problem, so many questions are kind of a, have yes-no answers. You've got a question, yes. it's answer yes or no. Um, and much emphasis up to that time, uh, starting possibly because for Turing that worked, so it worked for a long time. But then the many questions were, the answers are quantitative. You know, it's like you want to count how many things there are, or the calculus is all uh, quantitative. Right. You want to find you know, slopes, or you want to find uh, you want to some things. Um, so there, the issue is how do you recognize a problem which has an efficient algorithm uh, from, uh, and distinguish it from one one which does not. Um, so, um, and this this is often in cases where, you know, often a kind of accounting problem has an existence problem, a simpler version of it. But often the existence problem is uh, is easy. But still, to sum it up is is hard. So, yeah. um, um, so, so, uh, so one point where the result, I suppose, <laughs> I was pleased with it is that so one consequence is that, um, okay, so the kind of mathematics one learns in school, um, most of the mathematics one learns in school is also algorithmic. That you learn, you want to be able to com compute something with it. It's not not just a pure abstraction. So you want to be able to compute. So most of the things you learn in school. Uh, are efficiently computable, like you know, linear algebra, and the kind of don't know how much calculus you did, but you know you learn that the you know, derivative of x squared is two x and things like that. Okay, but it turns out, which came out from my results, is that for the calculus, which I thought I was promised in school that everything is easily computable, huh. in, fa in fact, if in high dimensions, it's kind of provably one of these uh, hardest uh, problems. So the simple things you learn in calculus, and uh, it turns out that if you've got many variables, x, x1, x2, x3, then these things are, um, are as hard to compute as, say, an NP-complete problem, right. or, or harder. So um, you, you're basically defining that level of complexity in this work, you're... Yes, yeah, so basically it's, it's um, so one thing which is amazing in <laughs> computer sciences, uh, which uh, we can exploit and benefit from is, is that there are some statements of great generality. Um, so um, uh, you know, so people talk about the search problem. Where a search, search problem is, is something where if someone gives you an answer, you can easily recognize whether it's an, you can easily check whether it's an answer, right. but it's maybe hard to find it. Uh, okay, so so you know, lots of problems like this. You know, also. Right. Um, um, so the question is, if you're given uh, just one, any old search problem. It turns out that for some of them, you can count the solutions efficiently, and for most you can't. You can't. And the ones you can't are all, all are all equal, provably the same. Right. Or many of them are provably the same. So you can. So this gives a technique for recognizing whether you should give up uh, looking for an efficient algorithm or not. That's a rather serious adjustment of the earlier expectations. I mean, your this insight uh, about the many solutions, including ones you don't even know exist. Yeah, so here the question is, yeah, there are many solutions, but, but maybe you can, you can efficiently count up how many there are or write down this big, big number. Um, or so in calculus, it's computing a volume or an area. Yes. Um, and so in high dimensions, these, are, um, these problems, you, you can understand why, they're, why no one's found an efficient algorithm. So it's like a systematization. So, without this computational viewpoint, um, you know, people thought of the, all these problems as being different and arbitrary, and, and this computational viewpoint gives you a, a clear way of systematizing your, right. your understanding. I, again, because it's a very rich career, I'm going to yeah. lead to '84. Now, by '84, your great yes. paper on, on learning. Uh, 84, where are you? Have we gotten you to America? Yeah, yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of here. I'm actually, I'm, I'm just back there selling my house, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I was here and then I went back for three years to sell my house. So that was, I was thinking of this during that period as well. So okay. I've got that association. Um, where, where basically are you doing the thinking that led to your theory of the learnable? 
Um, to where you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so some things I can remember exactly where I was, but this was, was over a period, I think, over a period. matured over a period. So I, I don't have a geographical fair, fair lo enough, but, location. Uh, um, but um, yeah, I mean, the, but where did it um, come from? Um, yeah, the, the process of thinking in that way. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure whether. Um, to how much with hindsight, uh, uh, but I suppose one way of saying it is, is that um, uh, you know, people thought of uh, of kind of human human phenomena. That's so, so like learning was a totally about as a human phenomenon, um, um, as something which is totally beyond science, and it's a waste of time for mathematicians yes. to, to think about it. It's some soft subject. It's lost to the humanities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't don't even t even touch it. Um, <laughs> But of course, I mean, the, the, the history is that in some sense, Turing's main achievement was to touch exactly this, because in his day, the idea of what's, what needs creativity and what needs what can be done mechanically, that's exactly what he distinguished. Um, so, so, you know, so I thought things could be done. Um, but I, I suppose the, I was mainly interested in, in human cognition, not so much machines. And I suppose the simple idea is that, um, that human cognition or like, for example, children learning words that you know, millions of people, children learn words every all the time. They see different examples of tables, and they but they get the same, same notion of a table. Um, so this is such a uh, overwhelming phenomenon, predictable phenomenon. There's nothing wishy-washy about it. Right. Um, that there must be some scientific explanation. And um, so one way of saying it is that um, so uh, what's represented in our brains. How does that cause? How does that map to to the real world? There must be some mathematical kind of way of thinking about that, um, because it's in inconceivable that this whole cognitive phenomenon is is, is just um, uh, it doesn't have a theory. It's just a um, trick which just happens to work. It right. works so well. It must have a <laughs> kind of must have a theory. Um, so kind of that's that's where uh, I started from. And then the. Uh, one decision to make is well, what aspect of cognition is is, is the fundamental part? Um, yes. Because people, like in artificial, artificial change at the time, I mean, people did work on learning. They also machine learning. They worked on reasoning. They worked on search. So it was natural language. A whole list of topics at a conference. The question was, which is the starting point? Mm -hmm. And so somehow I pretty early decided. So are, are you basically learning. in this paper setting the problem of of seeing the relationship between human cognition and uh, computation in a mechanical sense? Or, or is this purely an inquiry into human cognition? Well, no, 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 it's, 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 it's um, confusing the two. It's saying the two, <laughs> things are, two things are the same. So it's, it's writing, basically it's writing down some uh, criteria for what you want to achieve before you declare someone to, to have learned. Or a machine to have learned, or a person to have learned, uh, that doesn't matter. So people, once you say it, that people worry about machines learning now. Um, but it was totally inspired by, 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 by cognitive f uh, phenomena. How was it received as a framing? Uh, um, okay, so that's a uh, great question. Um, so certainly the, um, so, you know, so the community I was in was a pretty hardcore mathematical community. So initially there was, you know, some suspicion this was some absurd, absurd thing, and why, why are you doing this? Right. You know, it's kind of it. Uh, it can't be serious science, um, but um, yeah. So there was a lot of that reaction uh, initially, but I was lucky that there were some other people in the field who quickly uh, uh, picked it up, and there were some very good people, and so there was a small community formed who who who, who pursued this. In some sense, you've been working on that question or problem throughout your career from this point on. I mean, you you continue to look at the human and the machine equivalent issues about yeah, this. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yes. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, the equivalence is simply that, um, uh, so again, this is implicit in, in, in Turing, that Turing said that, you know, he's going to describe everything which is mechanically, some, any mechanical process, and that certainly includes the brain. So. Um, so, so the question really is, um, so the question of whether uh, human cognition is somehow can be explained in terms of computation, 
I think kind of that was settled by Turing. But the question is, you know, what kind of computation and yeah. it, can we make it useful? Besides having said that, you know, what happens next? Uh, this framing happens in the 80s, the mid 80s. Right. Uh, we're now in 2017. Um, what progress has there been in this investigation? Of, uh, because this is so now fundamentally recognized as a key issue. Um, are we much closer to understanding the relationship between human cognition and... Um, well, well, no, so understanding human cognition is what motivated me. Um, but, you know, so um, what, what exactly the algorithms we use, yes. uh, we, still don't, we, we still don't know. Still don't so know. the developments have all been on the have almost entirely been on the computer science side. People making machine learning practically useful, and uh, we, we, which it is. So, right. um, so it's um, it's almost like you know, if you want to analogize with, with Turing that um, uh, so psychologists in his day would you know would maybe debate philosophically what's creativity and what's mechanically computable, and so his influence is that you know. Now computers have taken over the world, but we still haven't settled the problems which the psychologists may have been interested in exactly what humans do. So, um, so being motivated by okay, so, so the human uh, f the phenomenon of cognition is so, so spectacular. It's okay to be inspired by that, which I, which I was, but I'm not telling you that I've solved it. Uh, this yes. human aspect. Yes, okay, yes. So, um, but but I think um, um, in the long run, I think you know. Computer science will contribute to that. Um, Hasn't there been? I'm going to just use a word that comes to my mind. That's probably the wrong one. Almost a sentimental notion um, that computers are solving educational issues and learning issues, and that there's been almost too much an embrace of what is computer generated and what really advances human thinking, or at least advances human learning. Uh, the teachers sort of jumped in, or maybe the corporations jumped yes, in, yes. but it was too early, yes. To yes, I, I, I entirely agree. I mean, so people tell me since I work on learning, well, what do you, what do you know about education? And I say nothing, you know, <laughs> that right. I think, um, I think uh, you know, what I've learned from my technical work is that, you know, human learning is very complicated. We, if we understand more about um, particular algorithms we use, we can do something. But um, otherwise, you know, the fact that the educational world tries different techniques and uh, yeah, tries yeah. this and that and the other, it's kind of what, what it's, it's reasonable to, you know, it's not that we've made much progress on that, which, uh, from my point of view. Right, right. So right. I think which they, is, you know. again, uh, I think uh, an issue not necessarily recognized by the society. It's almost right. been over-optimistic. Yes, yes, I yes, think. yes about the role of computers in, in human learning. So yes, I, I, I agree entirely, yes. Um, you also did work in the, uh, in the 90s on uh, parallel computing. Can you explain this inquiry? Y yes, so, um, so, so again, this is very basic questions in, 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 com in computing that, um, so Turing had his notion of, co of computing and then when people want to really build machines, then people thought a bit more concretely of what this, was, what this would amount to. So von Neumann had a more concrete realization. And the, and the main difference, uh, his main contribution is that his, the way he phrased it, <coughs> uh, this von Neumann architecture uh, had an implicit kind of efficiency, physics efficiency hidden away. So what it really means is that, so he postulated that you've got one processor, you've got a memory, you can access it. And, and the big mystery is that um, his architecture um, could be realized efficiently decade after decade after decade, even as the technology changed. Mm -hmm. Somehow his, his architecture had some physics insight so that, you know, uh, uh, for a computer programmer, the world didn't change very much, even if the machine totally changed underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a very powerful notion for the development of, 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 of the computing industry that um, you know, people wrote software on the one hand, a lot of people developed hardware on the other, which got different, different, more and faster and faster, but the two was, were separate. It's not that every time you had a new machine, someone would have to rewrite the program. So, so this is kind of a, incredible. Um, but in, but um, 
in, you know, so even soon after von Neumann, uh, of course, people realized that you know, if you have more than one processor, if you have parallel computing, which it did uh, immediately, then all this, then it's not quite clear what you, what you should do anymore. Uh, you know, von Neumann didn't have a recommendation what, what, you, should, what you should do. So if you've got many processors, uh, you know, what do they have access to? Um, um, how fast, etc., etc. I mean, the problem being is that if every machine you make differently, then you can't reuse programs because if a program exploits the particular structure of the machine. And in some sense, this problem permeates power computing in practice uh, even now. Um, so the question was whether, you know, what, what, what's a suitable abstraction, analogous to von Neumann, for um, single processor machines, which works with many processors. Mm. And uh, so, uh, so this interested me a lot. Um, so I did have this proposal in 1990, this uh, box synchronous machine, uh, which had, had some influence on, on, a, on a certain community, um, um, which is kind of some positive influence. Uh, I'm interested, and in, we touched on this a little yes. bit, and if it doesn't interest you, we won't pursue yeah. it, but this whole question of resistance to insight, not when uh, you, you choose a line of thinking, questioning as an individual researcher, and uh, and it goes into the world. Uh, there's the question of response, there's the question of colleagues, there's the question of uh, the perversity of your own nature and pursuing something when people are telling you this doesn't, isn't going to go anywhere. How does that fit into your career? Are you, are you very often talking along lines that people are challenging and wondering why you're going there? Um, sure. So, so certainly, I think uh, you have to be thick-skinned. Okay, so you have to be very, very, uh, very thick-skinned. Uh, I mean, you get all kinds of uh, of responses, which. Um, 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 which you know, uh, uh, you know if you regard it as amusing, it's, it's okay. But if you, if you, if you're uh, worried by it, uh, so for example, on this parallel computing thing, once I gave a talk. Actually, this was in industry, and uh, um, you know, rather tepid response. And, uh, and someone in the audience was sensitive to this, and it came up at the end to console me. Says, "Well, what you were telling us is it was too general. You know, <laughs> uh. you know, kind of people aren't interested in anything quite so." Challenging, okay, um, and a, 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 so if you want a different response, um, um, so I was going to uh, talking about learning. Um, so I gave a talk somewhere, and uh, there's a well-known philosopher in, in the audience, and uh, so basically I gave this mathematical definition of what learning meant, and then at the end, and he, uh, he said, "Well, uh, what you're describing." Uh, was already said by John Stuart Mill, except for the deltas and epsilons. This is, uh, was mathematics. And then, then I didn't say anything. And then he paused. He says, "Ah, maybe it's de deltas and epsilons which are important." <laughs> and I said, "Yes, <laughs> no, that uh, you know, so making uh, quantitative uh, science out of something is all yes. the point." Um, but I, as, as far as your um, general question, yeah, certainly. I mean, people have their lives and they don't want their beliefs to be uprooted every day, you know, maybe sometimes they're receptive, but otherwise um, right. they don't, so. Um. How, how concerned are you with the, I mean, you're a theorist, essentially, with the application or the consequences of your insights? Is that something you lead to fate? Is that something you follow in a way? Is there something you're particularly proud of having led to? What about that? Um, yeah, well, I think in some sense, all you can do is to leave it to fate. I think you don't, one doesn't have that much control. And sometimes one is pleased that some things which had very little influence were, were taken up much de decades later. So some things which I thought were pretty good, you know, people didn't, pe didn't pay attention to and some decades later, it's, it's, pe people take it up. So I think you, um, um, so I, I tend to leave it uh, to fate. I mean, so you know, I suppose I've done quite a few different things, and you know, some have a good response, some don't. So I leave it to fate. I suppose some some people are more uh, 
most salesmen and think they have to right. have to push it. And you know, so I've never done that. And if I had, I'm not sure that anything would, would be different. One of the other things that occurs to me in the spirit of this question is, uh, and again, something I think is very admirable, is one of the way one can characterize your voice, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that you're one of the people out there who is talking about the limitations of computers, or what we know. And it's a period, and it may have to do with not being an American or whatever, but more likely it's just in the nature of your intellectual interest, um, that you are in an era gone mad with expectations for the computer Excuse for learning. You are, your inquiry is about what we don't yet know or can do. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, so or what probably, or what can't be done, or, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I think, um, I think, uh, you know, computer science as a science is particularly good at that. So I think, uh, I think I'm uh, taking advantage of some aspects which are special to computer science. Um, again, so as with Turing, uh, said, said, said the pace in this non-computability. Um, so I'm absolutely not the only one in this, but um, no, no, I understand, of course. But of course, you could say that uh, that you know all of physics is limitations. They tell you that things go in straight lines. You know, they tell you what you know what can't happen. So saying that the laws of science are negative statements is uh, has some truth. Yes. Okay, so um, just saying you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Right. It's not, it's not perversity on your part. It's just no. a natural way of understanding. I, I think so. My last question really has to do with the kind of thing one always, the young always want to know from those who have uh, achieved so much in their field, and that is if they think about future direction of a career, what seem like the exciting directions now that one might jump into? Uh, I know there's no one answer or easy yeah. answer, but as you look at the field right now, um, yes, but I, but I think um, um, this may not be a helpful answer, but I, I don't think that, I don't think that's what I ever asked. You know, okay, that's helpful. Um, and certainly in the academic context, people will say, "What's the next field we should hire in?" What's the next? but but these conversations, uh, I don't think are. I mean, no one has that kind of insight. Um, no one could really see the, fu see, see the future. Um, so, um, well, not fully, but you can see the present. You can see where some of the direction of uh, research is going, some of the problems that really need to be solved if one took them on. Um, yeah, so one can ident identify. So I tend to, to, uh, to look at problems which, I, which kind of really looked uh, 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 ready, not, not just ready to be solved, but problems which need, needed solving. Um, problems needed solving, that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, okay, okay, so look for problems which need solving, I think that's, that's the... Look for problems which need solving, and, uh, um, and obviously, I guess, there's some judgment in whether there's any chance that you can solve it in the foreseeable future, so, so um, it's within your skill set. Um, but generally, generally fields saying going this field or that field, um, I don't think that's the right. The right so going to press you to tell me some problems that need solving uh, it, broadly within the computational universe right now. Where it may be directions that you yourself are pursuing, but yeah, well, and, uh, what, do, what do we need to know that is possibly knowable in the next? Five, ten years. Yeah. Well, some, something which I've worked on for decades without um, um, a, a, any um, final any conclusion is is very simple things about the, uh, the computation in the brain. That uh, just yeah. you know, how we store memories, how how you can store memories on top of memories on top of memories without disturbing your previous memories too much. Um, so even questions like you know how uh, whatever what, whatever you had for breakfast this morning, if you had breakfast. You know, do you use five neurons to represent it? Five million? No one knows. Um, but these questions, together with some more invasive methods of lo looking at uh, what the brain does, I think these things we um, should be able to resolve because I'm sure the brain uses some very 
definite, simple mechanisms for doing this, and uh, we uh, should be able to find out. What kind of uh, specialists? This just seems to me to call out for interdisciplinary yes, discourse. Yes, yes. Are you involved with conversations across many fields? Uh, colleagues who are trying to solve this with you? Well, um, yes, in the, in the sense that I certainly listen to what these experimental neuroscientists do, and I also try to persuade them to do certain experiments, and, uh, but that hasn't reached any, any conclusion yet. But, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's an area which, of course, an area which people have been predicting for a long time that something should happen, and I think inevitably it will. Um, Inevitably, it will <laughs> is a great last line. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you.